Welcome to Raw Politics. It's been an emotional week here in Strasbourg from Theresa May laying her cards on the table to a former prime minister joining the race for the top commission job. Here it all is, in case you missed it. We begin with the UK's uh, Tory conference in Birmingham, where two high-profile conservatives uh, were hoping to step out this week and show off their prime ministerial qualities. A lot of them doing that at that conference. Instead, they're under fire. One, the UK's foreign secretary, in a spat with Brussels after comparing the EU to a Soviet prison. The EU was set up to protect freedom. It was the Soviet Union that stopped people leaving. And the lesson from history is clear. If you turn the EU club into a prison, the desire to get out of it won't diminish, it'll grow. And we won't be the only prisoner that will want to escape. Pretty extraordinary stuff in uh, many regards. And as I say, it has sparked this real sense of, uh, of anger, I think, here. And, and it just keeps coming. And now we experience a new level of um, populism when the foreign minister of Great Britain Hunt comparing the European Union with the Soviet Union. Previous time he was insulting his wife, but here he does something more, far more different. Please, Mr. Hunt, show us the gulag. He's insulting not us, but millions of ordinary citizens who have lived under Soviet rule for so long time. Please show us the Stasi system in your country. Colleagues, uh, let me share the criticism on the irresponsible leadership uh, in the United uh, Kingdom. Let he be reminded that the United Kingdom decided freely to join the European Union. But in his case, I have to tell you, this, that is not so abnormal, uh, Bonfred. He, he has once uh, even confused Japan with uh, China. It also decided freely to hold a referendum on its membership, in which the citizens voted freely. Qualche differenza con l'Unione Sovietica c'è, visto che l'Unione Sovietica ha provocato anche milioni di morti. Non credo che l'Unione Europea abbia provocato milioni di morti. So Sikorsky is right, Mr. Hunt, you should apologize for what you said. That is in fact a point on which he has uh, to apologize. So a real sign of, of anger there. Um, and also it was reflected somewhat uh, when we heard from the EU Commission spokesperson at the midday briefing in Brussels uh, today. Again, not holding back his thoughts on what uh, Jeremy Hunt had to say yesterday. Let's have a, a listen. I would say respectfully that uh, we would all benefit, and uh, in particular foreign affairs ministers, from opening a history book from time to time. That's the only comment I have. I mean, Sophie, I mean, we, we listen to these words. These are pretty harsh words, and I think it's, it's, we see it's escalating. Are the gloves coming off now that the you know, deadlines are coming, the deadline for Brexit is coming? What are we witnessing now with these exchange of words? Look, I, I don't know why Jeremy Hunt felt the need to say this. Uh, incidentally, there is an irony in the fact that Brexiteers you know, across uh, the aisles, I would almost say, seem to feel the need to lecture the European Union on how to arrange their internal business even after they're gone. I really don't see why, but uh, I don't know why he made these remarks. I think they are uh, completely distasteful. Uh, they are very painful because, you know, some people still remember what the inside of a Soviet prison looks like. It's not that far away. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think... You know, why, even if he was making those remarks for his own domestic audience, um, you know, was, was he not thinking that other people are watching too? No, absolutely. It, it, it's, it, that, that aside, because this has obviously hit, this is, sensitivities have been, have been hit by that comment. But that aside, does he have a point in the essence of what he's trying to say in the sense that the EU might be holding on too tightly, that, that people feel that they're locked in? Is, is there a point to that? Message. Sorry, I, I really don't understand, you know, what, what that's supposed to mean. I mean, the EU, the EU are, first of all, uh, the governments of the member states and the people. And they chose voluntarily to be part of this family as a majority of British people has chosen to leave it. So, uh, and, and, you know, that's foreseen in the treaties. Uh, and you can actually see that ever since the Brexit vote took place, that support for membership of the EU is growing. So nobody is forced to stay. And I think it is, it is increasingly clear for everybody that it's, it's very important to, to stick together. Uh, Jeremy Hunt 
was clearly playing to a domestic audience. Uh, there is increasing talk that this man uh, could be a future prime ministerial material. I think the essence of what he's trying to get at here, though, is that Article 50, that, is trig that triggers the Brexit process, is clearly stacked in the European Union's favour. It is clearly designed to discourage members from leaving. Uh, second of all, there is an attitude among some people, particularly potentially the French, uh, that may want to punish Britain or to at least give the impression Sorry. that other countries... Th this is oh, not a this is, process this is all, to you know, this, is, this is beginning to sound a little bit like, uh, I don't know, Monty Python or something, you know, the French. <laughs> well, this, this whole story, that's a myth of the French or anybody else wanting well, to... Wanting to let me finish, let me finish. OK, wanting to punish the British, that's nonsense. If you, you know, the mood here is a completely different one. People are really, really sad about Britain leaving and they're becoming sadder as the date is approaching. It wasn't our choice, OK? Nobody wants to punish. That Article 50, which incidentally is in the treaty that was also supported by the no, no, UK no, I, government. I, I'm, not, I'm not speaking that, that it, it was, it, that Britain signed up to this, but yeah, clearly, but, but look, if clearly you're, the if European you're, Union the, it is makes making no this sense. process... Clearly the European Union is making this process difficult, is understandable. Yeah, they do not sorry. want people to leave. And there is a sense, I think, that what Jeremy Hunt is trying to convey, potentially, is that for a lot of British people, they feel that they're being punished because they made a democratic decision. But you know why they feel leave. that way? You know why they feel that way? Because they've been told this nonsense by, by the media the whole time. I mean, you know, it is simply not true. But you cannot expect... The point is that all the proposals so far, you know, when the government finally seemed to agree to some degree on proposals, because, you know, it took them two years to figure out what they actually wanted in leaving the European Union. And then they're asking for something which is impossible, namely breaking up the internal market. It's ridiculous. It was the Brits who, and uh, I very much agree, the Brits who've been pushing for the creation of the internal market, for the development of the internal market. And now they're leaving this saying, oh, but actually, you know, we only want the one pillar out of, out of four. I okay, mean, just, come on, that's simply, you cannot expect the European Union to unravel itself just to please the Tory party, because this whole problem has only emerged because right. of an it, internal rift in the it, Tory it's party. Not, it, it, and, and, and that is, in, it, to a degree, true, but it is just this sense of, like, this is not a club you can just walk away from. Now, that is understandable because it's been a union uh, that Britain has integrated itself over the last 40 yeah. years for, and the EU needs to protect itself, but in doing so... Clearly, Britain feels slightly boxed in. Because yeah, but of sorry, they give another but, another example okay. because when it's about security, okay, then the Brits are saying, "Oh, but then we want to be in." So it's also, you know, it, there is a, a large degree of hypocrisy here. So let's be honest: they were members for almost 45 years. We are sad that they're leaving. You know, many Brits are also sad that they're leaving. Uh, it all doesn't look as rosy as the Brexiteers had, had promised them uh, it would be. So to now say, oh, it's, you know, the EU is to blame, because this is a blame game. This is all about pointing the finger at the EU for the problems that have been caused by the Brexiteers, basically. Um, all right, I, very quickly, because... I, yeah, I just, I just think what is interesting, aside from all of that, is... Um, that Jeremy Hunt, A, made this speech in the way that he did. He clearly was playing to that domestic yeah. audience and people will have liked it. Um, listening to this backlash today, including from, you know, uh, some did other people who work at the commission, at we loss, talk about actually. having been born in the Gulag, imprisoned yeah. by the KV, yeah. KGB a few times. He's, this man goes on to say he's happy to brief you on the main difference between the EU and the Soviet Union uh, and why we escaped the USSR. And I think the, 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 the choice of comparison is something now that, the British Foreign Secretary, Britain's Backfired. chief diplomat, Absolutely. will be regretting. Indeed. And do, very quickly, do you think it, has, uh, it was at the expense also of negotiations? This move, this well, I think that's domestic more interesting. audience. Will this have a real impact? I don't will think it be? Will. will it? No. Do you think it will? I don't think no. so. <laughs> All right. Just in time for the holidays, Vladimir Putin's calendars for 2019 hit the shelves in shops across Russia. They feature Putin in a range of poses, from cuddling animals to marching with soldiers to taking selfies with a bridal party. In the past, Putin's swag has been popular in Russia, but with falling approval ratings and protests over retirement ages, we'll have to see if there's still an appetite for 365 days of Putin. His popularity right now, it's, it's suffering. Do you think this is going to help at all? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, 
can you say anything serious about this? No. I mean, this is his strategy. I mean, you know, in, 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 in Russia, this is... The, but look, I mean... Showing himself you know, you in can, an image you of... Can, you, as they say, you can fool some people all of the time and you can fool all people some of the time, but you cannot fool all people all of the time. I mean, at some point, you know, people will say that's all very well, but I don't want a calendar. I want a proper pension or I want a job Absolutely. or I want a, I want a house. I mean, seriously speaking, though, do you think Vladimir Putin has reached a point where, well, his popularity is not, is not as it was, is his hold on power? Uh, I would say he has uh, many lives. Okay. <laughs> Macedonia's prime minister is vowing to move forward with a name change for the former Yugoslavic Republic, despite a disappointing vote on Sunday. Now, with just 37 percent turnout, the vote failed to meet the threshold of 50 percent, and it's largely seen as a defeat for the West. Now, of those who did vote, 91 percent voted in favor of joining the EU and NATO, which is only possible if Macedonia becomes North Macedonia. The results uh, were celebrations from the prime minister, and he said, says he'll push the results through Parliament, where he needs two-thirds majority. But the opposition, who called for a boycott, is also claiming victory. All right, well, we are joined in the studio by Sophie Enfeld. She's still with us, a Dutch MEP with the ALDE Group. And also joining us for this discussion is Alois Petterle, a Slovenian MEP with the EPP. He leads the parliamentary group uh, for relations with the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. I'll start with you, uh, Alois. How, how big, really, is a division in Macedonia? When two sides celebrate victory at the same time, this means division, uh, polarization, and uh, we have yes and no situation in uh, Macedonia. Uh, low turnout, uh, formerly the referendum did not succeed, but on the other side, strong yes of those who appeared on the referendum. All right, but it's not just a referendum we're looking at. There's a bigger picture here, right? What is the significance? Of what, what is at stake? I think that uh, it's really more than just a referendum, uh, uh, but the main, the, the main point was uh, to get closer, to, to finish with the conflict with Greece and then to get membership of NATO and to start negotiations with the European Union. With that result, uh, at the moment, uh, there is no perspective in that direction. Okay, well, why is it so important that, I'll put this to you, Sophie, why is it so important that Macedonia joins NATO or the EU? Well, I think, yeah, it is indeed about choosing, you know, in what direction they're going to look, uh, east or west, you might say. And I think uh, with all its shortcomings uh, and everything you can complain about, the European Union is still a massive peace project and stability. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we like to complain about it, how bureaucratic it is, um, but in the end, I mean, we have created a continent where the quality of life is better than anywhere else. We know that there are forces outside the European Union, let's say, at, uh, toward, to the east of the European Union, who are trying to, uh, to sow discord everywhere in Europe, uh, and with a degree of success. And therefore, I think it is, it's really sad that there is this, um, this division in Macedonian society, because yeah. I think together we would be much stronger. And, you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of attention for a country of two million people, so clearly it is important in, in, in the geopolitical sense. What is the view? So I'll ask the same question to you about why is it so important for Macedonia to join NATO? It's interesting that all six countries uh, in different statuses wish to share European values and principles. They like to join, uh, and this would be the best solution. Uh, I belong to those who are sure that there is no better alternative uh, and we need peace and stability, democracy, developments in, in Balkans. Uh, um, thousands of people, uh, or, of citizens of those countries are living uh, to mm. the West and uh, we have to invest into that region. If not now, then we will pay later. And I would like to add that uh, also in uh, Macedonia, mm. uh, Opposition, this means the government and the opposition share the same ambition to join the European Union, but in the now, when the sol solution is uh, close, uh, they are different. All right. Well, Montenegro, just bringing in another country, Montenegro joined uh, NATO last year. And this past July, uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, he made headlines when he was asked if the U.S. would defend it uh, as part of NATO. And he told Fox News, Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. They're very aggressive, he says. They may get aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. Now, listening to that kind of, of, of statement, Macedonia uh, looking at this, 
what kind of protection do they think they're going to get from, from NATO with its biggest member, uh, Donald Trump, uh, the president, speaking this way? <laughs> well, you know, with, with Trump, you never really know what to believe. I mean, uh, and uh, very often he makes a bold statement and realizes that, uh, you know, he's, he put his foot in it and then but they uh, are retracts. The biggest. Sure. She's shocked that I picked her. No. Like in a state of shock. I'm not thinking, Mr. That's President. That's okay. I know you're not thinking. You never do. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Catalan separatists flooded the streets of Barcelona today on the first anniversary of the unauthorized independence vote. Thousands of pro-independence demonstrators blocked train stations, railways and motorways and pushed through police barricades in protest. But despite the big turnout, polls suggest that Catalans are evenly split over whether to secede. A year after the Catalonian administration staged a vote in defiance of the Spanish government. All right, well, let's uh, talk about this issue with Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. He's back with us. And Ramon Tremosa, he's an MEP for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe and who is from Catalonia. Well, let's uh, start with you. I mean, one year since that failed bid for independence, I mean, at what point does Catalonia and Spain just say, OK, let's just move on from this issue? Well, um, after the referendum that we hold one year ago, uh, there was the dissolution of the Catalan autonomy by the Popular Party government, snap elections uh, in December last year, uh, under uh, unbelievable conditions in Europe, in Western Europe, because half of the government were in prison, the other in exile. And instead of this, before Christmas, we got uh, the pro-independence parties got 2.1 million votes, the record height ever in a regional elections, so uh, got a new absolute majority. And I want to remind that it's not a question of one year on. In the last seven years, all the elections in Catalonia, pro-independence and pro-referendum parties, has got between 55 and 65 percent of the votes. So we have a problem on the table. All right. So you, do you think that this, this is still going to continue from the pro-independence point of view? Of it course. It's going to... All the polls. To are, what end? To uh, well, uh, separation? We, we also uh, were the kingmakers to change the Spanish government uh, a few months ago. And all the polls, including official polls done by the Spanish state in Madrid, are showing that the younger the people is in Catalonia, much more preference for independence. And the more education degree level has the population in Catalonia has, more preference for independence. So it's time that Madrid, uh, someone is realizing that we have a problem. Because until now they have been denying all kind of problem and of all kind of dialogue. <music> Welcome back to Raw Politics. Another candidate has thrown his hat in the ring to replace Jean-Claude Juncker. Former Finnish Prime Minister Alexander Stubb put his name forward for EPP Spitzenkandidat today. And our political editor Darren McCaffrey spent some time with him earlier. Darren, tell us about that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that he is somewhat the underdog when it comes to this uh, EPP uh, candidacy. It's going to be decided next month. It's clear, though, that he has got a campaign behind him. As you said, I caught up with him uh, earlier on today, and I started by asking him about his pitch. Why did he want to take on this job? You talked about trying to bridge these gaps between the East and West, the North and South, and you've talked about how Europe's ideological DNA is based on respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy quality, the rule of law, and human rights. Do you think that's Viktor Orban's DNA? Well, I don't know about Viktor Orban's DNA. I haven't been studying it, but I think it's a European DNA. I mean, basically, if we don't have values and if we don't stick to them, we have nothing. Remember, Europe, the European Union is not an ideological construct of left and right. It's based on values, common values, and they're engraved in Article 2. And my worry is that those values are being attacked, both from the outside, Donald Trump, China, Russia, from the inside, countries such as Poland, Italy, perhaps Hungary, and also from inside the APP with the likes of uh, Viktor Orban. The point is, this, if he doesn't share those values, and Marine Le Pen doesn't either, and the, uh, you know, uh, just the North Party in Poland doesn't, why, why is there a view? Why is there a view of what Europe is and what it should be any less valid than yours? Probably net, not less valid, but we're still in a rules-based union. So basically you have common institutions, common values and common laws and you have to abide by those. And obviously if you violate those, 
there has to be consequences. Now, I think we pro-Europeans, international liberals, whatever you want to call us, we, we, we need to listen to the heed, the, the, the sound of populism, because, you know, there are things that have gone wrong in Europe. You know, we haven't done well on migration. We're not necessarily very good at this uh, transition to the technological revolution. Uh, you know, we should be better on, on labor issues, etc., etc. So let's listen what these type of people have to say, and then let's try to sort it out. But my point is that in the EPP family, you have a set of values, and you have to stick to them. In the European Union, you have a set of values and you have to stick to them. That's the most important thing. But, but isn't the problem with populism, from your point of view, that it's actually quite popular? Well, yes and no. It depends on how you measure it. You always have to compare it to something else. Uh, and you, there's no magic potion to deal with it. You know, in Finland, uh, we took the true Finns into government in 2015. Their popularity rate at the time was 18. Once they came into office and we did austerity measures, we bailed out Greece, and we had the biggest migratory crisis since World War II, their popularity halved. So basically what happens is that when you come into power, uh, usually that power uh, does not do good for your popularity, but there's no magic potion. Should Jeremy Hunt apologize for the comments he made at the weekend? I find his comments repugnant, to be quite honest. Uh, I think they're ahistorical. And for anyone to compare the European Union with the Soviet Union, which, after all, I would argue, uh, was the source of a lot of misery, deaths of millions of uh, people, uh, you know, it just didn't make sense to me. Uh, we've had a couple of these types of comments in Finland, and I've always reacted quite strongly uh, to them. Uh, so, you know, again, in today's world, we live in different types of apologize this, apologize that. I just think it was a stupid thing to say. Uh, just finally, uh, you are pitching yourself to become uh, the new EU Commission uh, president, um, or the EPP candidate for that. Um, when was the last time that a white middle-aged man was not the EU Commission president. I don't think that's uh, it's always been, been the case. Uh, what middle age, yes, but I'd still hope that I can be a little bit a pitch for the next generation of Europe in the sense that I don't know who the youngest Commission president has been. But, but, you but know, is, isn't part of the problem here, though, about diversity? You yeah. know, 99% of this parliament is white. It does not reflect Europe. Hmm. In some ways, it never has. Yeah. And that's the problem. Does yeah. Europe need another person who has always looked like a white middle-aged mm. man? Is that it, does, mm. it, does Europe need that again? Well, there's not much I can do about my looks, to be <laughs> honest, and I probably won't. Uh, but I will say this, that I do think that we need more diversity also in the look of, of Europe. And that is, if I become uh, Commission President, remember this is a long haul, it's a one-year race, basically, all in all. Uh, I will make sure that, for instance, there will be more women as European commissioners. I think in the Barroso Commission it was about a fifth, uh, in the Juncker Commission about a third. I'd like to push it, ideally, uh, to about 40 percent, because that at least gives a little bit better of a picture of Europe. When I was prime minister in Finland, over half of the government were women, and I was proud of that. Uh, and what just, because uh, it is really notable on race, um, mm. how unreflective the European institutions, mm. the parliament is on race. Surely sh m more should be done there as well. Yeah, I think democracy should speak and we should see different types of variety inside the European Union. I would certainly welcome that. Eight people have put their names forward in the race to become lead candidate in their parties, including the EPP's other candidate Manfred Weber, Jan Zaradil for the ECR, and Mara Shevchevich for the SND Group. The Greens have also put four names forward. The list of contenders follows a long-established pattern in EU leadership positions, a lack of diversity. This wall in the Commission in Brussels showcases past presidents. All 12 are white. All are men. And it's not just the Commission. The European Parliament has had 29 presidents, all white, and only two women. And for more on this discussion, I'm joined by Maya de la Bom, who uh, covers uh, European uh, Parliament and Affairs for Politico, and Sajad Karim, a British MEP with a group of European Conservatives and Reformists. Uh, Sajad, I'll start with you. I mean, we're talking about diversity, and this place is all about uniformity. Does that bother you? Well, the phrase pale, male and stale <laughs> comes to mind when I watch that sort of a clip. 
because clearly the, the, the lack of proper representation of the European Union, the European Parliament and the institutions as properly reflective of the European Union as a whole, there's a long, long way to go. And actually I see regression rather than progression in that regard. Uh, following on from the last set of European elections, if you look, you actually see in the chamber behind us 40-odd uh, extremist far-right MEPs less than half that number from non-white backgrounds. Within the European Commission, less than 7% of employed people Why? come from diverse backgrounds. I think there's a, a number of reasons for that, um, far too complex to go into very quickly, sure. depending on the institution you're doing with. But the question shouldn't be just why is that, it's what are we going to do about that? Exactly. And Maya, because Politico has written uh, a lot of articles on you know, Brussels being blind to diversity, isn't anyone here bothered by that? I think um, there's a real issue with gender equality. I mean, enough in, to in do you? something about it. Like, yeah. yeah, there is a they, they, there is a problem of gender equality, and generally institutions are aware of it and are trying to make efforts. But when it comes to diversity, it feels to me that there is no. I mean, it's a very complex issue, but they don't. They're not making a lot of efforts to make this place more diverse, and it's all the more shocking that the EU. Uh, societies in general are diverse. I mean, I come from France, and France, society is diverse. So it should be reflected in the EU institutions. Exactly. As Sachet was saying, it's all about representation, isn't it? What is the impact then on policy, policy making, and on thinking when you have this kind of difference between lawmakers and, and population? Well, first of all, you end up with a real sense of distance between the decision makers and the citizens, because the citizens see that this is not properly reflective of society as a whole. So it's not just people from diverse diverse backgrounds who feel that, or people from, you know, one of the two genders that's uh, mis uh, underrepresented here, but people generally get the view that actually this is not healthy for Europe. And certainly those looking at Europe from outside, when they see us preaching about equality, about diversity, and making sure that w our strength is our diversity, then they say, well, you are nothing but words. And so all of these things play out in one way or another. And I think one of the most diverse is your group, in fact, the ECR. So once the, yeah. once the UK leaves, I think diversity is going to go down. I, I, yeah. I would say if the UK leaves. <laughs> if, okay. Protests have hit the streets of Romania in recent months amid concerns over the weakening of the judiciary. And today, that controversy hit the European Parliament. Viorica Dancila, the country's prime minister, attended the session in Strasbourg with a clear message. Show respect for the Romanian people. MEPs discussed the latest reform of the country's judicial system and their impact on the rule of law. Franz Timmermans, the first vice president of the European Commission, had a clear message. The latest developments are a source of growing concern for the Commission. He said the situation in the country had deteriorated and called on the Romanian Prime Minister to reverse its judicial reforms. But D'Angela stressed the popularity of her government and urged MEPs not to interfere. And uh, joining us now is former Romanian Prime Minister uh, Victor Ponta is joining us uh, from Bucharest. It's very good to have you with us. I'd like to ask you what the Prime Minister was saying, that the EU should not be interfering. Don't, do you think she has a point? <laughs> no, she has not. Good evening. I'm glad to be with you. I mean, uh, uh, Romania, since we joined the European Union, we have a sort of habit to export our internal fights. In the, on the European level. But uh, now we are in a very new situation. It's first time when Romanian leaders like Mr. Dragna and uh, the Prime Minister Dancila, they do not accept the judgment, the recommendation of the European uh, Commission and the Parliament. The second new thing is that all the political groups, they have uh, accused the government and, in fact, the real leadership of the country, Mr. Dragna, of breaching the rules. And the third uh, new thing, and I'll, I'll conclude with this and I'll answer to your question, is that this time we have a political leader in Romania not fighting for his political career, like it happened before with previous uh, presidents and, pri and prime minister. Mr. Dragna, back in Bucharest, is fighting for his freedom. He has been already convicted twice by the Supreme Court. And he's using the government, the Social Democratic Party, the parliament, just to solve his uh, uh, juridical problem. 
And of course, for this, he needs enemies. European Union, it's... Uh, it's the last enemy yeah. that Mr. Dragna found. Yeah, Mr. Ponta, I mean, uh, the, the, the rhetoric that uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Dancila was uh, using here, it's similar to what Viktor Orban uh, was using last time in Strasbourg. Is there a fundamental difference, do you think, with countries in the eastern uh, part of the EU and maybe here, Brussels, uh, here in, in, in the western part, sorry? There is a fundamental different reason, but the reaction is the same. I mean, it's not an ideological uh, issue like the one in Poland. It's not just an authoritarian leader like Mr. Orban, who just uh, wants to rule his country without any European interference. In Romania, there is an authoritarian leader who is facing two verdicts of conviction from justice. So he needs to change the judges, he needs to change the laws. He doesn't have time to wait for uh, the Venice Commission, for the European Commission verdict. And for this, he's, uh, even he changed three governments, Mrs. Dancila, she's just a puppet prime minister. She's not a real prime minister, she's the third one in one year. All right, thank you very much. Former Romanian Prime Minister Victor Ponta, they're talking to us from Bucharest. <music>
as well as it should. Uh, one thing you can say about the Conservatives, they certainly know how to fight with each other. She's uh, doing uh, an incredible work in a, in a horrible situation, but uh, let's, let's face it, I mean, uh, a bright future now, come on. I think they are facing heavy troubles, and I think that UK, Great Britain will turn into Little England. I think the businesses in UK are quite uh, afraid, and she's also gasping while saying it. <laughs> She doesn't even believe that herself. It's impossible to carry it off. And for a start, she doesn't even believe in it because uh, she's a Remainer. That's a fair point, isn't it? That the Prime Minister can't allow the breakup of the country. Yeah, it's a fair point, all right. She had no problem, and Britain had no problem breaking up our country. But then again, that's obviously not for discussion today. I mean, first of all, the no-deal threat is, is not... I mean, in the end, it will hit the British people harder than others. So, so it's a bit of a threat that you've got to shoot your own food. And uh, like it or not, uh, Britain is geographically where it is, beside Ireland, beside France. It's not beside New Zealand, and it's not beside Australia. Yes, it's difficult to keep unity in that that strange party we are seeing over there. And would you, are you going to get? Are you going to do that dancey moves as well? Well, I don't think I can never be that good. <laughs> so. I mean, she, at least she has a sense of humour. I mean, and she's. What do you think? This is a crazy. Well, I wonder uh, if our advisors have got that one right. I'm not sure myself. A lot of MEPs reacting there. Elmer, I'll, I'll throw it to you. What was your reaction to Theresa May's uh, speech today? No, first I saw they were playing SOS, and then I found out it was dancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Wrong, think, wrong, wrong pick a song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there were not very much uh, new in that. In principle, it's take the checkers without mentioning checkers, but he said he want to make other proposals and move forward. Uh, I don't know which room of manoeuvre she has after this Congress. And that she says the UK is willing to leave if there is no deal. Yeah. I mean, We also are ready to accept that they leave without a deal. So there we are, agree on that point at least. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the damage is it for all of us, but the damage would be for the United Kingdom much, much higher because of just the size of the different markets. Italy appears to be on a collision course with Brussels over its budget plan. Tensions reached boiling point when Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said that Italy was heading for a financial crisis similar to that of Greece. Let's take a look. Ich wünsche nicht, dass wir nach der schwierigsten Bewältigung der Griechenland-Krise alles tun, damit wir eine neue Griechenland, diesmal Italien-Krise, kriegen. Eine Krise hat gereicht, eine Krise war genug und wir müssen verhindern, dass Italien hier Sonderwege für sich in Anspruch nimmt. Die würden sie von allen in Anspruch genommen werden. Das Ende des Euros bedeuten würde. Insofern muss man streng und gerecht mit Italien äh, umgehen. Well, Juncker's comments enraged Rome and Italy's Deputy Prime Minister Luigi Di Maio was quick to fire back. He said there are European institutions playing at bringing terrorism to the financial markets. His coalition partner, uh, Matteo Salvini, also weighed into the war of words, saying... Sera Bruxelles, Parigi, Berlin, in Luxembourg. L'Italia è una Repubblica libera, orgogliosa e sovrana, che vuole dare un futuro e un lavoro ai suoi ragazzi e vuole controllare i quartieri delle sue, delle sue città. E quindi Juncker e compagni possono dire, minacciare, insultare, terrorizzare, noi siamo tranquilli. Siamo convinti che stiamo lavorando per il bene dei nostri figli, per il bene di questo Paese. Il signore, prima di parlare, prima di aprire bocca, dovrebbe bersi due bei bicchieroni d'acqua per tranquillizzarsi e rasserenarsi e smetterla di spargere sciocchezze o minacce inesistenti, altrimenti gli chiederemo i danni, perché l'Italia come la Grecia... Il Presidente della Commissione Europea se lo deve risparmiare. All right, you mentioned Salvini, and, and there we have it. I mean, do you, don't you think the EU is being a little bit too tight with Italy when it, in its uh, reactions? First, let me make a remark. The European Union is not a bloc. It's a community. It's a union, not a bloc, as more and more people say. And uh, that is not acceptable uh, mentioning the European Union. Mr. Salvini, that's a different story. He has not violated uh, the system of the rule of law. He does a wrong policy in monetary and fiscal policy. And therefore, it's a debate that is another level of debate. Uh, and uh, here, he does a policy you know, for the country which has an overall sovereign debt of 135%. Yeah. Uh, and this needs okay. 
careful solution, otherwise the interest rate will go up and the Italian people it, will pay the price. Seconds, we'll pay it the just... price for it. As Emmanuel Macron scrambles to claw back popularity in the polls, he suffered a major setback. Another key ally from a match movement is walking away. He was Emmanuel Macron's strongest supporter, his right-hand man, mentor, and loyal confidant. Colomb compared their relationship to that of father and son, and he even wept at the president's inauguration. We love each other, Colomb once said, but the dream team wasn't to last. With the honeymoon period over, the relationship began to sour. It started with minor cabinet disagreements, a series of summer scandals and a scathing interview followed in which Colomb said the president lacked humility. Colomb finally announced he was leaving the government to run for mayor of Lyon, a decision Macron struggled to come to terms with but was forced to accept. That's the week that was here in Strasbourg. Don't forget to join us again on Monday, 6 p.m. CET, 5 p.m. UK time, only here on Euronews.